time in the 40s and 50s anybody to sell sex on TV. Look at it now. What is happening to great America where she like Rome, like Babylon, like Sodom and Gomorrah is degenerating into the fountain head of immorality and corruption. In Africa, you know, they don't talk about homosexuality because it never was an African thing and they have laws against it. But America says, if you want this money that we are willing to loan you, then you have to change that law. Obama goes to Kenya and says it, and, and going back to earlier, I'm not against Jenner or whatever her name is today. I'm not a hater, but you can see the agenda. I can't even let my kids watch any TV now or go anywhere. They go to school and hear about it. They're force feeding my children, not just sexuality, when that's not their business, that's called pedophilia to push sex on kids, but they're pushing stuff that isn't natural, and then they say, I'm a hater and want to take my speech away because I can see an agenda for these perverts to get involved with my children. And this, um, sir, is why in the nation and in the Quran, we, we can't have abortions. And the Catholic Church was, I believe, for that, not a, a birth control, but not abortions. When I was on the mall a few weeks ago in Washington, I talked about my mom, and I talked about the circumstances around my birth, and my mother knew that if I came to birth, I could disrupt her relationship with the man that she was with because my father, whom she married, and he um, was a handsome philanderer, so she got rid of him, but he came back on the scene and she was pregnant with me. The man, my mother's very dark, and the man that gave my mother her first child is very dark. So my, ch my brother is dark. But my father was light-skinned, curly-haired. So she was afraid that if that baby came to birth and was light-skinned, it would destroy her relationship with that man. So she decided to abort me. And she tried three times to abort me. And on the third time, in those days, and she used a hanger. And she was unsuccessful. And I came to birth. And I said that on the mall to all those people that were there and to the millions who were watching. If my mother were successful in aborting me, what would the world have lost? Jesus was born under strange circumstances. And he had, she had to be put away privily, as the Bible teaches, because if she were seen pregnant, the law was, where's the husband? Where's the father? Well, you say Holy Ghost, but we know there's no human being born without the agency of a man, that's real. So they would have killed Mary. But her baby was the last prophet to the Jewish people, Jesus. I'm saying that to say this, every prayer that we pray is answered through the womb of a woman. If there were no Steve Jobs, and his mother aborted him, we might not have had iPad, iPhones. We might not have had the tremendous advancement that we have made in science and technology. It all came from a child born from a woman, some simple woman yet producing 
greatness. This womb is the workshop of God. And when you pray and I pray that our loved ones who die of cancer, some die of AIDS, some die of diabetes, some die of Alzheimer's, there is a cure for everything. And that cure is not going to drop out of the sky. It's going to come from the womb of a woman and a baby that was given a chance to live and to grow. So on that mall that day, I asked every woman that was expecting, I said, put your hand over your womb. And I prayed that what was in her womb, if they would let it grow to term, that that baby would be a child that would work to build a new and better world for all of us. And that's why we are against eugenics. Mr. Muhammad was death on birth control. He called it a death plan by the government against poor people. So we find that we are kindred spirits in so many ways. And you know, Mr. Jones, I felt that today. I felt that when we met and you could question me and strip away whatever there is, if there's something to be stripped away, that America could see me as I am, white people could see me as I am. <laughs> Put yourself in that position as a moral judge. I think you should keep quiet. In the mind of Satan was to set up a one world government where he would be in charge. They talk about me, but they won't confront me. What the hell business is it of yours? But America should keep her mouth shut. I didn't mean to be so fired. Oh, no, that's good. It's good. That's my passion. And perhaps a dialogue could begin because the one thing that's missing in the dialogue, even with Mr. Trump, nobody's talking about the future of black people, the future of the indigenous, the Native Americans. This country the original sin of America is the destruction over 120 million native people. And when Master Farad Muhammad came, there was only 2 million Indians left. Millions of us were brought out of Africa, not to be citizens, but to be made burden bearers of the real citizens. So our sweat and our blood made America rich so that immigrants could come over and find the American dream on our nightmare. So if Mr. Trump, and I believe he's bold enough, if he knew how much God is interested in the future of black people. Not that he's not interested in the future of all people, but he's interested in the future of black people for this reason. You know, there's not a Jewish person that suffered under the Holocaust, could come home to their mom or dad with a German as a boyfriend or girlfriend, not right away. Time 
had to erode the pain of what the Holocaust really was. But black people, no matter what we have suffered up to this very moment, we have never been spies for any foreign government against America. We have never risen up as a force against the tyranny that has been imposed on us by our government. We have fought in every war from the Revolutionary War all the way up to the last war that there was in the Gulf. And we have never turned against our country. We have a heart, Mr. Jones, of forgiveness, a heart that today we can love those who have done us so much evil. So God wants to use us. That kind of heart. And that's what I said on the mall. Thomas Jefferson and the early writers of the um, Declaration of Independence, they knew that slavery was wrong, but they had it. And Thomas Jefferson made this statement I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. So we've arrived, Mr. Jones, at a time when what people have sown, all of us, we have to reap. America has sown some terrible things. And in a time of reaping, that's why I know that the present powers, they don't love the American people. They don't even love their own children because the scripture says, prepare slaughter for the children, for the iniquities of their father because somebody has to pay for the evil that the government is constantly pouring, not only on us and on white people and poor people, but on all the peoples of the world. So I close thanking God for you in this moment, hoping, hoping and praying that what is done with these words from you and myself will open a door that dialogue can continue and that this may just be the first because you've got so many questions yet to ask of me and I want part two to be better than part one. Well, I'll tell you, this has been a great interview and, and I've talked about the least I ever talked and I, I know you've gone for an hour and a half. Uh, I've got like four or five other questions. Is that all right? Four. Go ahead. I don't want to engage in tribalism, but that's how all people operate. We're all the same. And people operate in groups, Ford, Chevy, Cowboys versus the 49ers. Uh, people like it. It's, it's easy. It's not that folks are even stupid. It's just it's easy to get comfortable in your own group. It's easy to play into that. Uh, you get rewarded for that. The system kind of wants a dumbed-down dialogue. But even when you want to do the right thing, the system winds people up. When I grew up in Dallas, uh, let me tell you, I, I can sure tell some stories about racist black people doing bad things to me, but I'm not stupid enough, like Martin Luther King said, I judge people by how they actually operate and who they are as people. I have a lot of black friends as well growing up. But I didn't get a chip on my shoulder and then just project it onto all black people because I also had groups of people, you know, that are what you call rednecks or whatever, who were in their own group who looked just like me, but if I wasn't in their group at a certain place in time, they would just attack me. Uh, that's tribalism. And I was smart enough by the time I was about 16 to go, these black people act just like these white people. Uh, or if I ran into a group of you know, racist Mexicans that mugged me or attacked me or whatever, I didn't then project that onto Mexicans in general because uh, four Mexicans attacked me and broke my leg when I was 16. But at the same time, even if you want to work with people, if you're unable with the media control, the media manipulation and these systems, when they do kick off racial division, racial hatred, and then hype the stories that legitimize that by 
conservative Americans going in and blowing